Hey everyone, Maya here from My Storybook and welcome back to My Storybook's interactive read aloud special event celebrating Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month this May. Every weekday this month, I have been sharing an interactive read aloud with you that features Asian or Pacific Islander characters or children's book that was created by Asian or Pacific Islander authors or illustrators. If you're interested to see what we've already been reading or what we are going to read next, you can find the full read aloud lineup on my blog, mystorybook.com, by clicking on that link down there in the description below. Otherwise, my friends, you can also subscribe to my storybook YouTube channel and follow along the Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Playlist, where you will see all of our reading adventures. Now, let's take a look at today's interactive read aloud. Today, we have a story that features Hmong refugees, the Hmong community. This book is called The Yang Warriors, and it is a very empowering book about, about a determined group of refugee children who are determined to confront and face the hardships that there are in the refugee camp where they live. In this story, one of the hardships they face is not having enough food in this refugee camp that they live in. So this band of children are going to go on an expedition, a voyage to try and go and find more food. They have been training for it. They practice fighting. They practice hunting. They practice gathering food. And they are ready to go and make this journey to try to find food to help everyone else and themselves in the refugee camp. Now, you might have remembered from our earlier stories, especially Four Feet, Two Sandals, about what a refugee is. If not, my friends, a refugee is someone who has to leave their home country because it's not safe and they leave it to find a new home somewhere else. Before they can find a new home, though, they might stay in a refugee camp, a place where they have to wait and live until they are able to resettle and find a new place to live. And if you remember from the other story, Four Feet, Two Sandals, the refugee camps aren't always the nicest place to live. There sometimes isn't as much food or it's harder to get water and new things like clothes. But you'll notice that the children and the families here don't let that discourage them and stop them. They just let it make them stronger and they work together to make the best out of the situation that they're in. So double thumbs up if you're ready to get started. Excellent. Let's begin. The title of today's interactive read aloud is Yang Warriors, written by Cal Kalia Yang and illustrated by Billy Tao. That means that Cal Kalia Yang, she's the author, so she did what in the story? She wrote all the words, and the illustrator, what's their job? Draw all the pictures. And this book, my friends, was published by the University of Minnesota Press, so big thank you to them for letting us read this story and share it together today. All right, well, what do you notice going on on the cover here? <laughs> Right? I see this group of children, and let's count how many there are. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's a group of ten children, I notice. They're all wearing, like, different colors, kind of like rainbow clothes, right? What do you notice about the setting, the background? It looks like they're in a refugee camp, and you'll notice the houses. They look like they're made out of wood and straw, right? And they're in, maybe it looks like a forest or a jungle. I'm also seeing these vines across. They almost look like vines, but they also almost look like barbed wire, which is a wire that has these sharp thorn-like points on it. Hmm. So here they are. And these kids, how do you think they feel? Or what do you notice about like their faces, their expressions? look like determined kids, right? They're smiling. They look like I'm ready for a challenge. They look like good friends. All right, let's find out what's going on with these Yang Warriors. So here's our title page. It has the title of our book, Yang Warriors, author, illustrator, art publisher, University of Minnesota Press. So here it starts with a little overview, a look at the camp. Where is the story taking place? And it tells us the Bon Benai Refugee Camp. 1986 is the year. What do you notice, my friends? 
it looks pretty big. I noticed these like tent like structures. It's in the middle of a forest, it looks like. All right, let's see what's going on. Above the television set in the dark room, the legendary heroes rose. The bald monk mobilizing his energy, the honorable warrior facing his enemies, the brave woman with her sword at the ready. The children sat with wide eyes and open mouths. As soon as the credits started, they raced outside to practice. So what do you think they were watching on TV? They had this little TV. All the children were watching these like incredible heroes and heroines. And now they're going to go outside and practice. Practice what? Maybe their own fighting skills. In a clearing between the houses, the children bowed to their elected leader, the leader they chose, a 10-year-old cousin named May, the Hmong word for little. Master May was tiny. Though his arms and legs were small, his belly was round and sat on his middle like a bowl. He had been chosen because of all the cousins in the camp. He cared the most and believed that the fiercest that the children were powerful warriors. Master May acknowledged their bows with a slow nod of his head in each direction. The children knew he would not leave any of them behind. So he was chosen as leader because they trust him, right? How would you describe Master May? <coughs> He's loyal, trustworthy, strong, determined, fierce, has faith in people. When you believe in people, people are attracted to you. They're drawn to you because you make them feel good about themselves too. The children saw the enemies that existed everywhere. The guards with their guns. They practiced the art of throwing rocks and thrusting sticks. The other refugee children looked for play space. They held each other by the waist and kicked the air. The lonely ghosts waiting on the other side of the fence. They ran drills, running fast in one direction and then the other, so they could confuse and outsmart. So it looks like they are trying to learn different strategies for fighting these enemies that are everywhere around them, right? A lonely ghost waiting on the other side of the fence. So these must be the ghosts looking in. Wonder who are these ghosts? Let's see. They had all heard the ghost stories. People who had died because of broken hearts or aching bellies. They didn't have enough to eat. People who had left behind loved ones and were hungry for a return to friends and family. So these ghosts that stand on the outside are people who died because their heart was broken. They didn't have enough to eat. Seems like people who died maybe in the refugee camp or family members they knew. There were seven boys and two girls in the group. All of them were younger than Master May. Each morning at the crow of the roosters, the pot belly boys stood at the ready, lines drawn into the dirt of the camp. The children arrived one by one, each with a flat rock in hand. They went to their lines and balanced the stones on their head. When their shadows disappeared beneath the noon sun, they ran to different homes for meager lunches of rice balls and dried fish. Meager means kind of small lunch. After lunch, they resumed their practice. The sticks in their hands were sacred swords. So why do you think they stand there and balance the rock on their head? <laughs> to practice maybe like balance and movement, being steady, controlling their body. My friends, you should try that. Go find something to balance on your head and see how long you can keep it on your head. Then they play with sticks and those are their swords. Or they train with sticks, not play with them. They're becoming warriors. What do you notice in the clouds? <laughs> it's them in warrior version. The children engaged in mental battles, battles in their mind. Master May chose a pair of kids and the others stood in a circle around them. The chosen ones bowed. They sat cross-legged on the dirt, eyes tightly closed, backs rigid, and sent their warrior spirits into the space between them. They fight with their spirit. The sun's heat traveled through their hair and clothing until sweat beaded their brows, and dripped off their chins. The mental matches lasted from minutes to hours. The winner was the one whose concentration and stamina could not be shaken. Finally, Master May said, well done, disciples. Well done, children. Well done, followers. Wow, a mental battle, my friends. You should try that. Sit with a friend and in your mind, have your spirits fight each other and see who can last the longest sitting there still and concentrating. Do you think you'd be good at mental battles? One especially hot week when camp rations were thin, when there wasn't as much food, Master May took a seat alone in the circle of the group. He closed his eyes and meditated, he thought. After an hour, when the youngest member of the group, a five-year-old named Ong, sank on her knees from exhaustion, he opened his eyes and said, 
We must leave the camp to forage for grains. The younger children need it. So they're going to have to leave to find more food because the younger ones need some food. The words were dangerous. Everyone knew the rule. No Hmong person could leave the camp without permission from the Thai guards. The children had seen men and women beaten for leaving the camp. People had disappeared after reports about their leaving had been filed. What do you mean? What do you think that means if they disappeared after people found out they left? Nothing good, right? So he's saying they have to leave though to find food. Otherwise, the younger children will starve. So what are they to do? They're not supposed to leave, but if they don't leave, it's a hard decision, right? Each child drew in a breath and held it, waiting for Master May to clarify his vision, to speak of something else, but his shoulders were stiff and his eyes far off as he explained. There is a farmer with a pond full of morning glory nearby. If we are caught by the authorities or the adults, I will fulfill my destiny as your master. I will take all responsibility and bear the punishment. What a leader, right? He's saying, if you get caught, blame it all on me. I will take the punishment to keep you all safe. I was a scared child, comforted by the pillow of my mother's arms and hold to my father's hand. I was not a member of the group. My older sister, Dog, was one of the two girls. She was seven years old then, a small girl with thick, messy hair, one leg shorter than the other because she had polio, this disease as a baby. Her job in the group was to carry everyone's flip-flops if they were in a fight and flee situation. Her job in the group was to carry everyone's flip-flops if they were in a fight and flee situation. She was also the best at mental battles. So it sounds like the person telling the story, she wasn't part of this group, but her sister was in this group and she's sharing their story. This must be her and her family, her and her sister, her mom and dad. The night before the secret mission was hot and humid. A layer of dark clouds had gathered beneath a full moon. In our bed, Dog kicked her legs restlessly. Restlessly means she can't really sleep. Why do you think she can't sleep? It's probably nervous, right? They have a secret mission that's pretty dangerous. What do you notice about where they sleep in their room? <laughs> On the floor, they sh all share one bed together, right? Doesn't look like there's much space. When the songs of the crickets and the snores of our father were the only sounds of the room, Dob whispered, tomorrow might be my last day. I whispered back, why? Her voice was low and serious. Tomorrow we are going on a mission. I asked, where? We are leaving the camp to look for food. I couldn't find enough air in the room to breathe my words. You can't. Job said, Master May believes it is the only way to save you and the younger children. You haven't had vegetables for weeks. I said, I don't even like vegetables. Besides, you'll get in trouble. The guards might kill you. So if they find out, you could die. She swallowed and said, if we don't come back tomorrow, tell mom and dad where we've gone. At first light, we set out. Long after Dob fell asleep, I could not. I listened to the sound of my scurrying, watched the light of the moon through the slits in the walls. She must be very nervous for her sister. I'm scared for them too. They are quite brave to risk their lives to help the other children in the camp, right? The next morning when I woke, the bed was empty. My mother had left to tend her small garden of cilantro and green onions, and my father was carrying the day's water from the well. I looked at my sister's place beside me, and I knew she was not in the yard standing at her line. I put my hands over my quivering belly. Quivering means shaking. Why do you think her belly's shaking? It's probably nervous, maybe hungry too. I watched the adults prepare lunch. My father blew into the red embers of last night's fire until a small flame danced among the burnt wood. My mother smashed chilies, her green onion, cilantro, and salt in the mortar and pestle. They were thin, their faces tired. I knew they were probably hungry and scared too. Each time I closed my eyes, I saw the end of the battle scenes from the historical Chinese dramas my sister and our cousins loved. Smoke rising from fallen houses, the bodies of horses, men, women, and children scattered across the dirt and bleeding and still. Fallen flags trampled into the wet dirt. So she's imagining these scary scenes, right? She's worried for her sister or maybe... Maybe she also saw something like that when they had to leave their home to come to this camp. So my friends, life in the camp was very hard, right? They didn't have that much food to eat. And it is scary. You don't know what's going to happen next. What if my sister was killed? I was about to tell my mother about the secret mission when I saw Ong. She was wet and she carried a plastic bag of grains. She leaned it quietly by the doorway. Before anyone noticed, she left. Wait a minute. 
So she has this plastic bag of greens. <gasps> Do you think they were successful? Did they manage to get them? I hope that's what it means. I followed. Um, where's Dob? Hurt, she said. I blinked the tears away. What happened? Mimi were injured. The two of us ran behind the corn husk shack. My heart pounded with each step. Oh no. Oh, so they got the food, but so many of them are hurt. Oh dear, my friends, what happened? She is very hurt. I saw my sister lying on the dusty earth, her head on Master May's lap. There was a wound on the side of her forehead, a cut. A wound is like a cut somewhere we got hurt. Blood ran down her face. Another cousin was also on the ground. His foot was wrapped in an old shirt. Ong yelled, Grandma's coming! The children scrambled. By the time Grandma arrived with a switch in her hand, her head shaking left and right, the line of her mouth tight, only the fallen ones remained with Master May now on his knees. So Grandma, how do you think Grandma feels that these kids did something dangerous? Not happy about it, right? There she is, she's holding the greens. Oh, do you think she'll be okay? Most of the group had been caught when they scattered. There was not much talk. No one wanted to attract the attention of the guards. Grandma Switch flew into butts. Swimpers and yelps were caught in throats. Master may suffer the worst of the consequences. Grandma said, you are the oldest. You could have killed them all. If the authorities find out what would happen. So Grandma's giving them a spanking or she, a switch is like a rope. And it sounds like she's kind of using it to hit them, right, as a punishment. And she's not doing it to be mean. She's doing it, and it does hurt, but she's not doing it because she's evil and mean. She's doing it to try to teach them a lesson. She was so worried for their safety. She thinks if she does this, then it'll help remind them not to do dangerous things again, especially Master May because she thinks it was his idea because he's oldest. He's responsible for them. For lunch that day, though, the younger children and I ate fresh morning glory. <gasps> How do they feel about the food? Mmm. The greens were fried with garlic oil and seasoned with fish sauce. I can still hear the crunch of the stalks and the taste how the oil made the rice slippery, how the garlic made it all slightly sweet. None of the children in the group chose to enjoy the meal with us. They watched us clear our plates. It was our first taste of freedom. Before lunch, the group had been naughty children playing a game. But after that meal, all of us saw that they were brave and powerful. Why do you think the children chose to eat the meal with them? <coughs> maybe they wanted to eat separate, enjoy it on their own, or maybe they got the food for the younger ones. So they wanted to see them enjoy it. They got it for them, not for themselves. That is very brave and kind and loving, right? So before they thought those kids just like to play fight, but now they're like, they are actually really brave and powerful. I knew the adults had all survived a war, but I had never imagined we children could be warriors. Long before we left Ban Vinay refugee camp, the Yang warriors showed us what existed beyond the fence and gave us the courage we needed to leave. So remember, refugees usually come from places of war. And she knew the grown-ups had done it, but... Children can be warriors too. Children are strong and they have ideas and courage and plans and can help each other survive as well. They give each other courage. When you have one person brave and sharing courage, you can inspire others to be brave as well. I see them now, far away from that dry, dusty, hungry place we shared beneath the burning sun, the group of warriors standing strong. Master May, firm belly forward, Ong on her tiptoes, trying to be older than her years. Dob, chin held high, her stronger legs braced against the earth. They were my heroes, not the characters in the movies. And they were my heroes, not the characters in the movies. And they are glorious in the sun of my youth. So now she remembers them. Even though it's been a long time, she can remember all of the children in that group. These children were her heroes. These children were the ones who helped her make it through the refugee camp and get through it. Not those heroes on TV, but these actual children who showed bravery and courage and strength in the face of hardships. The end. And here the author has a note. This story is based on her own experiences in the refugee camp. She actually, her sister actually was one of the children in that group. So this is based on a true story, my friends. These children actually did these brave things. They went through these hardships. These families had these experiences. 
these scary experiences, but they did work together to share bravery and strength and help each other through it. Wow, my friends, what a powerful story. What was something you liked or learned from this story? Right? This story shared a lot of scary and sad things that happened to these people, these Hmong refugees, but it also shared moments of courage and bravery and hope and family and strength. And that is also important to remember. I love how in the end, she said that her sister and those children were her heroes, not heroes on TV, but these children who actually helped to make a difference in her life and others as well. All right, my friends. Well, that brings us to the end of this interactive read aloud. If you would like to share with me any of your own stories or experiences or about your own reading adventures, please reach out to me on the blog, on Facebook, Instagram, all the social media links can be found down there below. And if you enjoyed this interactive read aloud, please be sure to subscribe to my Storybook YouTube channel by clicking on that subscribe button and giving this video a thumbs up. I also hope to see you for the rest of our Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month read alouds. There's only a couple more left, so I hope you still read along with me. I've had so much fun sharing these stories with you, and I can't wait for our next ones coming up. Otherwise, my friends, until next time, happy reading! Thank you.